Okay, I will open it up in a moment. I just want to uh, ask, um, particularly Martin and Ed, um, two things really. One, I'm surprised nobody mentioned tax policy. Taxation of property and land uh, is surely also a major problem here. Very odd system of taxation. Um, which is in heavy need of reform and could undoubtedly pay a, play a part in a more rational property market. But the second thing, um, to either of you or both, is that the sort of nationalisation of land, which is what it was, and the zoning, the heavy control and the green belts, all came about as a reaction to the massive sprawl of London in the 20s and 30s just grew out munching up farmland for mile after mile after mile till people thought, well, enough of this. Now, I'm sure you're not advocating going back to, as it were, London and Birmingham joining like Tokyo and Yokohama. But if not that, what kind of pricing mechanism would you put in place to ensure that there were, you know, in Ed's terms, sort of cost-benefit analysis about the amenity value of land, rather than simply, I'm sure you're not suggesting farmers could sell it off at the low price that you quoted. So how would we sort of manage it in this better world? Um, on the first point, I was given seven to ten minutes and, I'm sorry. And, no, don't, don't. and I thought <laughs> if I started on, on land use taxation yeah, yeah, yeah. in the UK, there was no way I would get Fair away point. with an, out another five minutes. Uh, my first best, as everybody knows, is site value taxation. Uh, the, uh, I'm a Georgist in this way. It's not going to happen. No. Uh, uh, so that point one. Point two. And that's obviously pro-development. So once something has been designated for development, you start taxing it. Uh, and you clearly tax empty properties and empty unused land as if it were used. That seems to be very important. Uh, the UK, uh, that's the optimum. Um, what we have at the moment, of course, is, is beyond insane. I mean, in the sense that we have muddled up a tax that is designed to, to cover the cost of providing services for councils. Uh, which was why I've got the council tax in place, the old rates, with a land tax. Um, that was ridiculous. One of the results is it's sensationally regressive uh, in terms of the taxation of uh, property values, um, uh, basically the incidence on uh, highly valued properties is, is, is near zero. Um, it's amazing to me that that's permitted. So I would have a straight proportional tax on value if there wasn't anything else. Uh, and if you did that, you could get rid of this equally absurd stamp duty structure since transac transaction taxes. The reason we've got that is to make up for the fact that we're not taxing high value property properly. But I mean, all this is so completely obvious. Uh, and I don't even talk about the fact no, no, that no. we're operating with a, a valuation, which I think is 91 property. 1991 values, which I think if you tell anybody from any sane country is sort of, is sort of seems stupefying. Um, so I've, I've just sort of started on this. No, our, our, it's given that land value is the, the dominant form of wealth in our country. I mean, the, the absence of, and I've not talked about, um, of course, about the, the fact that CGT, not that I'm suggesting, isn't applied to owner-occupied dwellings, another distortion. Obviously, the imputed rent is not taxed. I mean, it just goes on forever. So th this is a massively untaxed asset, which is like basically a transfer to um, wealthy people. Uh, so it's massively regressive in the terms of the society, and I think massively economically efficient, since I'm a Ricardian, I, you, know, it, you should tax rent. That's what you should do, and lower taxes on on uh, on uh, um, on energy and enterprise and capital accumulation, and all the rest of it. By the way, this is the most interesting conclusion from Piketty's work, which is that the one thing we've really done is create a what he calls a patrimonial middle class, and it's basically this. But we don't uh, tax it. The second point on your planning, um, sorry, it's taken a little while. I think there are a number of ways to go. But I suppose basically what I was trying to say very briefly is more or less what I understood Ed to say, is you do preemptive cost-benefit analysis, 
so. Uh, and the question you ask is, why shouldn't we develop X area? Well, the reason why you wouldn't want to develop X area is that the, its value in the alternative use, and you can, you, obviously there are various alternatives which you would get out of the market, okay, for best use, uh, uh, do not offset the some measure valuation of the immediate value, that's obviously subjective, but it, you can put it down in, in numbers terms, which makes seem to make some sense. Um, you can even discuss pe with people what they think it might be worth and how, find out how much they might be prepared to pay for it. You could also then throw in, obviously, um, uh, infrastructure costs. They have to be covered in, in internalized in some way. And you could possibly consider internalizing um, externalities related to congestion costs. And if the, the particular designation passes these tests, you designate it as being for development, whereupon you tax it as being for development, and that's what happens. And so you have a pro proactive policy. And then the, the final little comment I would make, I understand the objection about sprawl, which had obviously a lot to do with the motor car and it's in its link with urban development, which is not unimportant. I don't want to create Los Angeles everywhere. Some people love it, but I don't. So I'm not, that's not what I'm in favor of. But I would just turn it around and point out that if we'd had these land use planning rules in 1800, modern England simply wouldn't exist. There would be no London, there would be no Birmingham. The population of the UK would be probably five or six million and everybody would have gone to America and people would say, well, we know a country like that, it's New Zealand. That's a stupid thing to have done and doing it now ex post remains as stupid. And now, this is really, really important, really important. It seems to me that in the last 25 years, 30 years, the combination of income growth, immigration, um, and so forth, with these policies is generating a true social and economic disaster. And we're not thinking about what this means. Okay, Ed, you wanted to come in? Yeah, I, I almost want to start on the last, last comment, which is just remember that the, that the ultimate, the reason why this is so important, right, is that London is this economic engine and this engine for opportunity. And if the city is constrained, it's not just that we have some dislocation in some arcane market. It is millions of real people who suffer because of this. Um, two sort of sort of points. First of all, you know the key point on the on the the, the green belt versus building up. I, I think a good place to start is by doing some simple calculations of what we think the social welfare losses or gains are from a variety of current regulations as they are in place. My own guess would be that probably the site the site rules are going to be the biggest losers in these. But you know, I, I, you know, I, I defer to the, to the data, but my guess is that it's very strong height restrictions in central London where the value of li uh, land is enormously high are, are ones that feel like they're much more likely to be costly than restrictions on, on building out on, on the green belt. But um, you know, this is something that quantitative analysis should, should do, and then we need to focus on reform where the, where the gains are, the gains are, are, are highest. Um, and to, to you know, return back to the Georgist point, I too am, am a Georgist, uh, I, I, but I do think we need to think about what we want land taxes, property taxes, to get two groups of actors' decisions right. And I think this is both in Martin's comments, but I just want to reiterate it. We want to worry both about not stopping developers from building, which means the land tax does that, right? It stops the developers from having any distortions. It means whatever you put on the thing, you're not going to change your tax bill. And that's great. That's a wonderful thing about the land tax. But there's also the distortion of the government. And we know that you know, the public actors are at least as important in the current world. And that's why we want, essentially, the, the taxes paid by the developer to be proportional to the land value, but not proportional to the amount that they're built, but the revenues received by the community to be proportional to the amount built. Right? So you want essentially a system, and this is fairly easy to, to, you know, for economists to come up in our, with in our technocratic way. You need a system that basically taxes land but then allots income on the basis of development across communities in order to get both actors, actors incentives right. I'm going to open this up, but just to come Sorry back to you both on this, the trouble is that if you take, you know, the, this is economists who can indeed measure these things and give us these numbers but the truth is and you both know this that in this country and country in particular people will say ah oh, but there is an intrinsic value to St Paul's Cathedral Canaletto got it right and what you're now proposing is to take that away from us you're saying you can measure 
the importance of that view or this beautiful countryside. Whilst I'm not saying you're wrong, you know better than I do, particularly Martin, how powerful, how amazingly powerful the lobbies are on the other side. And so in a sense, uh, th there's something missing in the debate here. Clearly, the demand, to put it crudely, the demand for the need for housing doesn't quite outweigh the demand for the beauty. We live in a democracy. So why doesn't this work in a democracy? It's a fully functioning democracy. Why doesn't the need for housing overwhelm the need for beauty? But I, I don't think, I think that's a false, uh, a false trade-off. I mean, I think, first of all, when well, Ken's modified... Right, it's I mean, a real trade-off in Britain now. But in lots of cases, right, we're talking about building restrictions that have, you know, absolutely no major protection of beauty in a major way. I mean, no one's talking about tearing down St. Paul's for goodness. No, it's not we're tearing about, it down. We're talking about, to, about... It's seeing it from Richmond Park. Restrictions, it's seeing it from Guys can see it with a... With a you know, with a telescope, right? So it's, it's and we, the way we would normally quantify this is by one, one way is to compare property values that actually have views of this with property values that don't have views on this. So I know how much a view is worth in Manhattan because I can, I can compare identical apartments on the second floor with apartments on the 24th floor. And typically they go at somewhere between a 20 and a 30% premium. So, you know we, know, we know something about what these, what these views are worth. I'll give you that it's not, it's not easy, but I think any sort of serious attempt to quantify this is not gonna come up with huge numbers for many of these many of these views. The problem is, of course, the political rhetoric is incredibly potent. And, and, there, and there I certainly agree with you that you're right. And there uh, I think economists are typically fairly challenged in our ability to make this case. The environmental argument is a powerful one. And especially given that particularly so much of the suburban opposition to development is itself couched in environmentalist terms. Mm -hmm. I think of making out the point that much of this suburban anti-development ends up being bad for the environment when it's close in, close in suburbs, not good for the environment, in some sense imposes a hypocrisy tax on the people who push it. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a useful thing to do. Um, but, you know, uh, I have to yield to someone else in terms of winning this political <laughs> rhetoric debate. Well, I, certainly I have no idea how to do it in, in the UK, and I don't think I really know how to do it in the US either. In so the, it's a, sorry, I, yeah, yeah. No, Martin, Michael, 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 I mean, the politics of it are absolutely hopeless. Uh, the the that's why I was I become so despairing. The um, I mean, I suppose the general point is that there's no way within this political process that the potential gainers can compensate the losers, and I suspect that if we could create the relevant market, which we I don't think know how to do, um, I've been thinking about it. Maybe Ed has a solution. The the uh, the people who would get the houses, who would who who don't as a result of, you know, all my young colleagues, are, mm. and we are not talking about underpaid people, no, no. not obviously city people, basically now have to live, to move somewhere, which involves, means three hours commuting a day, or maybe four, right? Well, that has really large costs. But, and they would obviously pay a great deal. They just can't pay enough to go and buy a house in London these days because nobody can, except unless, the, uh, unless they have um, favored parents or they, they're unbelievably successful. So the, um, they can't pay for this. The political process doesn't allow their vote to be relevant because it actually, by the way, they're not going to vote in any of the places where these decisions are made, except in the national elections, and this is a very small issue in that context. So there's no way the politics of Westminster, for example, could allow for the, be the, the potential benefits for somebody who now has to live in Birmingham in order to compute to London. I'm not saying that's the most plausible, but the sort of thing that happened. So there's no way you can make this market work once it becomes political, which is why once you've got the restrictions in place and the whole system develops around those restrictions, restrictions, getting rid of them becomes almost impossible. And then you get the second round of problems, which I did discuss, which is the immense economic vested interests in this, which is, I've just bought a house in some nice area in London, say near where I live in Dulwich, uh, where the houses cost one and a half billion pounds, and uh, you're proposing a policy that might halve the value of the price, in which case I'm bust and my bank is bust, and that's mm -hmm. a problem. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is one of the best examples of Hayek's view that once you start restrictions of this kind, you cannot escape from them. So I'm really despairing. <laughs> Uh, really despairing. I think it's a terrible social and economic disaster for now. Um, so, I, as I said, I'll take anything that's going extensive, intensive, whatever you can, whatever you can persuade people to take. But it's interesting that 
In the Conservative Manifesto, I didn't mention that, I don't, don't remember the label. So is the Conservatives the pro-market party, quote unquote, right? They are, they believe in the market system. They have actually done something about trying to liberalize planning controls, planning restrictions a little bit. It's an absolutely clear state, statement, no green belt will be changed mm -hmm. at all, anywhere, ever, under the, <laughs> finished. The whole country is frozen. That's a. Do you want to say anything about it? No. I, I actually on. think that it really is. I still think it's possible to eliminate the extremes and, and, and to achieve success. Again, weaving in the in, the the, uh, the issues around uh, sustainability, right? Yeah. And and the fact that a million people are coming, where are they going to go, right? And and I think spatial analysis can come in alongside <laughs> to, to because if you, for example, said, okay, we're not going to maintain these quarters from between six and 15 miles across London, and we're going to limit it to five, right? What would that pick up in terms of spatial possibility, which would more than take care of the problem, right? And I actually think, to me, it would be, because the alternative to building into the green belt, I personally would think that's going to be less efficient anyway, unless you actually build transport out to serve higher density in the green belt. But it's, if it's going to be developed as the surrounding communities within the green belt, it's not going to take care of the problem. So it's got to be developed. So we're talking about 40 or 50 story housing well, no, blocks no, no, no. in talking, uh, no, no, no. all over London? Eight, ten. Eight, ten but we do know, and one thing we, I was going to say, one thing we do know is up is easier than out. As you said, Martin, there, there's a, there's a, there may be a prohibition on building on the green belt, either real, I mean, written in manifestos or in, by implication there, real in some. But up happens. So we kind of know that it is easier to go that way than it is that way. So we've kind of learned that. And, and not all over London, Martin. I mean, the question, I mean, if I, if I think, and, and maybe you can speak a little bit more about how this works in the UK context, if I think of the areas in which you can really deliver extra space in the US, it's brownfield sites, and it's when they're allowed to be developed to a really high density level. So very few existing neighbors, and you can really add, yeah. you know, brownfield site, former industrial site, there, yeah, put it up to 40 stories if, well, if the market will bear. Or Battersea's sort of in that direction. Anyway, we must bring the audience in. There are hands and there are microphones somewhere. So uh, uh, let's go hand at the back, hand at the front, and then at the back. So we'll do them, chop at the back first. Let's, well, who's got a micro? Has anybody got a micro? Oh, there then, right. Let's start there. And then the man at the back, and then the man at the front. Um, hi. I, I thought the answer to Do you my... say who you are if you'd oh, like to? Oh, excuse me. Eric Rouen, Europa Capital. Um, I thought the, quest the answer to the question that Michael posed about the common themes in four London boroughs was going to be that they had all witnessed the tearing down of high-rise buildings built in the Le Corbusian dream that Correct. had brought attendant um, social problems with them. And don't get me wrong, because I believe in the densification of land, as I have often yearned going traveling through suburbs of US uh, towns and cities and yearning for a throbbing heart to, to the city. But I would submit that one of the issues that has contributed to the lack of housing supply has been um, the uh, perhaps over-democratization of our planning process, the abolition of uh, Order 14 rulings uh, on costs that's created something of a planning free-for-all. To explain to me what an Order 14 rule is, forgive me. It's where an objector has to um, pay into court the um, costs in okay. the event Thank that you. they should yeah. lose uh, their, um, their, their challenge. Um, like and, and moreover, we have a planning right. situation in which it seems that bats, badgers, and great crested newts, who have their appropriate place in ecology, have a bigger vote than the public good. Okay, and striped bass on occasion, I think. You're right. And take, yes, we'll take two or three. So, gentlemen here, and then if we can get the microphone to the guy at the back, please. Does this work? Yeah, excellent. Go on. Um, question for, for Ed. Um, you say, if you again, say who you oh, are sorry. if you'd like to. Yeah, my name is Alexander Lamont. I work for MSCI. <laughs> um, you compared London and, and Mumbai, and I'm going to make a simplistic uh, sort of uh, a hypothesis here, but which I'd like to test with you. Uh, if you want to increase density in London, I think you'll have to sacrifice heritage. Uh, imagine Chelsea, Kensington. If you want to increase density, you're going to have to build up and hence destroy part of the existing urban fabric. By building up, I believe the public transportation system and the underground might survive if you upgrade it and modernize it. Yeah? 
Mumbai, uh, I think, has already made a choice. I've been going there every year for the last 15 years. They are building up. They have destroyed, so they've sacrificed heritage. Mumbai does no longer look like the colonial town it was 100 years ago. But the public uh, transportation system is suffering tremendously because Mumbai is built on land, reclaimed land, and I believe you cannot build an underground. There is no underground in Mumbai because you'd just be in knee water deep. So um, do you believe that it is worth making the sacrifice of heritage in order to increase the density? And I'm going to bring one more example is Le Corbusier was mentioned a few uh, minutes ago. Le Plan Voisin, which he had developed for Paris, was literally going to destroy everything in the center of the city, uh, including Place Vendôme. It was widely rejected. I am sure it would be widely rejected today. <laughs> so again, density is the economic solution to all the problems you've mentioned. But I don't believe that politicians or even the citizens would ever vote for Plan Voisin in Paris, no one in London. Nor, nor would I, for that matter. Sorry? Nor would I, for that matter. Yeah. So, so all the, the, the theories that you've explained are correct, but in practice, is it going to happen? OK, well, I mean, I just, I mean, high rise, I mean, density doesn't have to be high rise, as Michael said. Density doesn't have to be high rise. My, the favorite factoid in this regard is if the whole of Greater London were developed at the density of House Manny in Paris, it would house 35 million people. 35. So more than half of the population of the UK could live in Greater London if it were simply built as House Manny in Boulevards. So uh, we just sort of need to decon deconstruct, I think, density and high rises. But Michael made that point. Do you, well, let's take the third chap. And it's still adding Fair but point. You, but you, if you but had wait. Chelsea, Kensington, Chelsea across all of London, you would double the population of London. And certainly Earl's Court compared with Chelsea. But let's take the third point, and then I'm going to come back to the panel, and then we can have a bit We're of... trying to get rid of all our houses. Interaction. These Go terrible on. people. <laughs> Man at the back. They knocked um, down my house. The question <laughs> I've got... Um, it's not it's Chelsea they're against, it's Dulwich and Hampstead they're trying to kill. Order, order. <laughs> right. <laughs> We, we can get it's not going to happen. <laughs> You're we can right. It's not going to happen. That, uh, <laughs> we can get a consensus that we all want more housing. Uh, we can get a consensus that we all feel we need more affordable housing. And at this time in the election calendar, we can get every political, every poli local politician explaining, competing with each other as to whether a developer should have to have 20% affordable, 30% affordable, 40% affordable, or, or what have you. And this is really an economics question. Um, if we all do want to see housing, uh, affordable housing, uh, more affordable housing, and ultimately more housing, period, is placing the cost burden of delivering affordable housing on the shoulders of the development community actually the best way for us to deliver uh, affordable housing? Or are there other possible solutions that we should all be thinking about? OK, three good questions there. One is. Um, but it won't be the developer. Is planning over-democratized? Second, um, the density issue. And third, um, I think if I can deconstruct your question, uh, is taxing housing to build housing uh, necessarily the right way forward? Right. Um, sure. Um, uh, yes, it's over-democratized. No, we shouldn't tax supply to encourage supply. Um, and uh, third, uh, density is, um, you know, I mean, uh, there were good answers that were given here. Older cities, even the older ones in the US, do have legitimate heritage issues, right? The historic beauty of a city like London is part of its appeal. It's part of its magic. It's part of why talented people want to be here. Just, just so in Paris, just so in Barcelona, and so forth. All of these issues are very real. But it doesn't mean that all of the city needs to be frozen in amber, right? It doesn't mean that every spot in London needs to be sacrosanct. Now, the trade-off between the sort of five to 10 stories versus 40 stories is a question of how widely you can imagine allowing rebuilding. 
the wider you're able to imagine rebuilding, the more we can just have a, a Travers dream of going to Houseman 10-story stuff. If you're living in a world which I thought was the world that we lived in, which you were giving me, you know, four acres, right? I mean, you're giving me some tiny industrial spot, then if I'm going to make any difference, I've got to actually deliver 40 stories. But given that you're probably going to give me a fairly crappy piece of land that's probably pretty, pretty far away from you know, anything much, I'm not going to be destroying the historic heritage of London by putting some skyscrapers on a... And the other thing, point I want to make about Corbusier, and this is also true about, about high-rise social housing in a variety of ways, there's something that is just so different between advocating the freedom to allow developers to build up if they believe they can generate housing that will fill demand for this versus saying that I am a social planner and this is how I think poor people should live by putting high-rise housing, right? High-rise social housing did often end up being fairly disastrous. High-rise, you know, I grew up in a high-rise building in, in Manhattan. Nothing disastrous about it, right? I mean, it's, it's, these are, there are ways of doing this that are, that are good. And, and it just, I just think comparing the two things, comparing Corbusier's dreams, which were just made in a complete lack of connection with the way that people, people live, versus the reality of how for 50 years developers have smartly produced high-rise dwellings that actually sell, that rent, that are, that are desired by their inhabitants. I just think that's a, that's a, it's a false comparison. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, absolutely, yeah. And there's, I mean, interestingly, most of the new housing that's been built in high-rises, well, I'd say 98% of the new housing that's being built in London in high-rises must be owner-occupied or private market housing. So it's, it's actually, if anything, it's inverted the whole model from the social housing only to private only within a generation, remarkably. Anyway, Michael, and then Martin. The only other thing I'd throw into the mix is uh, you know, the implications of all this are huge generationally as well. I mean, this is another big, big issue where the, the younger generation is getting screwed, right? So policy-wise, one of the interesting things also to think about is how do you, how do you, I mean, if, if you accept that generally, I don't know if, we, if anybody's correlated the amount of house by age um, the existing population has at its disposal, can you induce any kind of transfer, right? I mean, the, the better solution is it's not efficient for empty nesters to be living in houses that can accommodate families. And, and, and actually, towers do solve things for the young and for the old. I mean, Martin, you. This is the patrimonial middle class I was going to say, we, we've, I, I mean, think it's slightly. Green belt and inheritance. I think it's slightly, cousins, aren't it's they? slightly wrong to think of it as, though it's not completely, because basically, this is right. but. It's, it is an intergenerational point in part, but it is, I think, even more fundamentally an intragenerational one in the sense that, as far as I can see, the only youngish people who have a reasonable chance of buying a property in London is if their grandparents or parents, through inheritance or gift, are able to help them. Um, so the, that may not be true for everybody, there are obviously exceptions, but I think therefore this is one of the elements, ways in which um, society has transformed in terms of the opportunities for young people, wherever that, whatever their background is. It's become more, uh, this is a Piketty point, which I think is correct, but he just doesn't make it in his book properly, which is that we're back to a sort of patrimonial system. Uh, which I think violates our basic principle about equality of opportunity. So that's point one. So it's a very, very big deal. I could give some numbers here, which, are, which you probably all know, but they are really quite interesting. If you're thinking about eight times earn, average earnings of house, uh, it's quite obvious nobody can borrow that to, to pay for the house. Um, uh, the, uh, what was the, what were the, the, sorry, I, the one over the, um, there was a point over there which I just for, um, um, forgotten. Uh, um, affordable housing. Affordable housing. Yeah, yeah, yeah housing I've, 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 sorry, that was the one thing I want. Oh, yes, democratization. Well, terrible thing, democracy, but it's sort of, uh, <laughs> it'll with be us. Uh, um, <laughs> affordable. Oh, yeah. Would it be easier to not... This is a political question. Simply dealing with politics. Is it, as a matter of fact, easier to, no, easier to knock down bits of London and build higher, higher housing or to, to encroach on the Green Belt? And I don't know which is going to be really politically more difficult. Maybe the Green Belt is more difficult because it's become sort of a sacred object uh, of, for some strange reason, even though much of it is hideous. But the, um, there's no controls on the activities in the Green Belt. Most of them are just nonsense. Uh, so um, 
um, farming and other ugly ones. And so uh, our farm, modern farming is just about the ugliest activity in the world, I think. I honestly really do think modern farming, modern industrial farming is just about the ugliest thing on earth. And so turn, since it's also of no economic value whatsoever, it's just a hobby. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, look at the contribution of farming to British GDP, it's a hobby. It's not an economic activity. It, it, this is really Ed Glazer's point. It is not an economic activity. It's a nice hobby, very tax subsidized, <laughs> but it performs no economic function and it's hideous. So I don't understand this thing about supporting. There's lots of beautiful parts of Britain, wonderfully beautiful parts of England, but not modern large scale farming. So it's just absurd. Um, it should, should just be stopped. Uh, <laughs> okay, so, I think, I think so, you're not sorry. going for the farming vote <laughs> like this, tonight. So, but we, I, just, I think all these sacred cows have to be killed. Now, final, the, final, the final thing, uh, American large-scale farming is even more hideous, vote, But I just want to write in Martin's name on the, on the, on the parliamentary vote. Yeah. And then, yeah. and the, 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 I think the affordable housing thing is right. It's obviously not logical. Never it can be logical to tax the supply of something to, to increase the, 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 a variant of supply to other people. Nonetheless, and, and I'd be very interested in what Ed thinks about this, maybe he doesn't think it's a problem. I do think one of the problems with the way we've gone, so we're dealing in the second best here, really second best. We have screwed up the system completely so that basically the only people who can afford to, to buy a house in London or even to rent by now are unbelievably well-paid people or people um, crammed together, or people who have an inherent inheritance. A thriving city needs a large number of people to provide services, uh, which in general, many of which are paid for by the public sector and whose wages are grossly inadequate. Now, one way you could handle that, and my wife actually wrote about this, is to, to allow our teachers in London and our fire brigade people and our policemen to be paid three, four or five times as much as in the rest of the country. But in general, that's really politically difficult mm. in a uniform society like ours. It's not a federal country. That means we have to arrange some sort of housing system for London, and that's because I think it's really an important issue. S given that, let another distortion, nth best, as I said, um, so that we can have policemen and nurses and uh, and teachers and so forth living here and therefore providing us our school, our, our operating all these services. And without this sort of mess, uh, which you describe, I don't know how we're going to do it. So we do. So we have to think about how we manage in this very, very constrained optimization problem that we've created. And this is one of the dilemmas, it seems to me. Okay, now we, we, I know we're supposed to stop at 8.10. I'm assuming the um, wrapping up bit will be very short. Yeah, it will be. What? If you carry on. I'll carry on, right. Okay, because there are some two hands. There's one there and two there and one there. So let's take, let's take all five. Let's just go round them all. Okay, one here and then I'll come all the way round, take them all together quickly though. Do them short and sharp, okay. please. Uh, Simon Clark from Linklaters um, spent most of my early career on development land tax, which incidentally just didn't work. <laughs> Um, question for Tony, not the panel. Um, this is incredibly nuanced and sophisticated and difficult. Um, how can we have a nuanced, intelligent discussion against a 24-hour news cycle and a political cycle that is between two and five years? You know, what is the way ahead where these sort of issues can actually be thought through rather than just uh, knee-jerked into the future? Okay, I'm sure Martin will have something to say about that too, and every, all of them. Right, let's take the questions in a line there, and then the one or two over here. Make it illegal. John, John Forbes, as this is in many ways a function of the excessively dominant position of London in the UK, could we solve both the problem of the decrepit state of the um, Houses of Parliament um, and London's dominance by moving the political capital? It's been tried before. Uh, next question. Um, moving along those, uh, Peter, probably. Yes, I've oh, got a mic here. Oh, oh you've got the mic there, then, Peter. Yes, yeah. yeah, sorry. Um, sorry. I've got an incredibly simple question, and it is to really dumb it down. Going back to the title, you know, Cities of the Future, if I was to give you a world map tomorrow and, st and tell you to stick a pin in that city of the future, where would it be? And why, if you have a reason? Right, we'll use that as the very last question. It'll be a good one. Maybe we all like those. Very good. Peter. Should planning decisions in London of any material scale all be taken by the mayor 
not by the 33 small boroughs who don't really have a pan-European perspective, a uh, pan, uh, pan-London perspective. Very good. And one here and one here. Uh, can we bring the... Oh, is there another question? All right. You know, you have your, you've got the microphone and then here and then here. Yep. Hello. Uh, I'm John Lutzius from Green Street. Uh, question from the standpoint of a real estate investor. On the one hand, you have uh, planning rules that have helped uh, make supply responses very hard to do, and we've gotten very high values <coughs> per square foot. <clears throat> On the other hand, we have uh, the worry about where are the future workers going to live. So where are we on that curve? It, the, the planning helps us in, in the early part uh, with capital values, but then I think you're, you're potentially talking about a future disaster where employees can't afford to live. Uh, how much should we worry about that today? Is this, a, is this a big risk for real estate values in London? Thank you. Okay, and then here. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm tempted to say in some ways it appears to me the market is working and that it's not these artificial constraints on supply. So, for example, there was a graphic margin that you put up about the number of houses being built and effectively the public sector has gotten out of house building. So, you know, given that the private sector would necessarily gravitate toward the least risky um, home building and the most profitable, then obviously there's a slice of the market that's not being addressed. And, and, and so, uh, you know, which seems to me a natural working of the market. I, I think there's perhaps also an issue and again, this may be simplistic and only applies to a few key cities like New York, London, and so forth, but you know, the, the, the wage growth of, of some of the employees in the main industries of these cities is such that um, with these very high salaries, they in effect can afford to buy anything. Um, and so house prices are being driven up because people can pay it, and frankly, money is no object. Um, so. To, okay, to the extent that related to a good question, and then last here. Please. Last question, I guess. Um, so isn't the answer up and out in the sense that, you know, we have a huge infrastructure project called Crossrail coming through, which should benefit places like Reading, Ealing, and, you know, um, uh, Stratford. And these areas should or could see the benefit of building up and within 15 minutes, they can be in in London. So why aren't we why aren't we extending Crossrail out further potentially, um, and why aren't we promoting the, the the use of up and out? Oh, you had a hand. I'm so sorry. I'm no, no, let's take absolutely everybody to get. To, I'm so sorry. I'm distracted by these people over here. Hi. Um, you know, um, uh, I was thinking about London and uh, in terms of uh, property prices, right? Um, you know, like, for example, Knightbridge. In Knightbridge, you have Arab people, Russian people buying every 15 most expensive property. Usually, the price will go up, um, you know, if you have someone who will pay the price, it will be the price, you know? And it's like London is very popular for rich people around the globe because, yes, it's beautiful, it has fantastic culture, it has rule of law, which many countries, you know, lack. And I think it's like a hub that attract, you know, talented people to. Like, I'm from Ukraine personally. I love London. I came here, I was in Germany, I was in Switzerland. I came to London, my first thought, I love it. I'm staying here. And, you know, I talked to my peers, it's very appealing, so I think you have here a component, and I don't know whether something is possible to do. Um, you know, like, um, until London is as attractive as it is, you cannot stop prices going up, because there always will be rich people from around the world who would favor London. Okay, that's definitely a theme of sort of the Yogi Berra argument, you know, this place is so, or whatever it was, this place is so popular no one wants to come here anymore emerging, I detect, uh, that somehow London is so popular that somehow it will damage itself and therefore, because people want to be here, prices might fall. I think I picked a bit of that up. Um, but there are other issues besides. Um, and we'll save the city of the future question for a final uh, straight down the line. 
uh, answer. But um, Ed. <laughs> okay. Uh, she answered the questions you wish. There okay. Were eight yeah, of them. Absolutely. I'll, and I'll, I'll go quickly. Um, Global demand for London, you're absolutely right. And I think the, the view that London somehow or other is on the verge of failure and collapse as a city is you know, uh, completely wrong. The issue is that there are huge winners and losers from this. And what happens when London doesn't build, when you constrain supply, is not that the city has doomed itself to complete failure in some way, but it means that ordinary people can no longer afford it. So it means that the city you know, persists as a boutique town available for the hyper-rich of the world, but there are thousands, millions of real people who pay the price of that. And that's, that's, I think, the critical element here. And it's critical that cities maintain their ability to be engines of opportunity. I think this actually gets back to the issue of affordable housing requirements on development, which I will always speak against because they are a tax on supply. But one of the, one of the points about them is that their advocates will say, look, we couldn't get through this project unless we had the affordable units, unless we made it really obvious to people that this was actually providing tangible benefits for middle and lower middle income people. And that's a political statement, not, a, not an economic one. And I, I, can, you know, I can accept that. I'm not sure if it's right or not. I would say in response to Martin's point, one of the ways to deal with the need for this is to fast track projects that are going to provide lots of small, you know, usable units for, for middle, income, middle income people. Um, one more, two more points. Um, Mayor, larger scale in general. The larger the scale, I mean, this point was made earlier that you know when a local community, the smaller the neighborhood is, the more likely it is just to become an incredible nimbus enclave opposed to any new development. In part because the people who would benefit aren't there, right? And until you have a way of compensating the current residents for it, moving up the geographic ladder towards mayors, towards regional government, does tend to internalize some of this. Does mean that you have different people at the table other than just the homeowners locally who don't, whose right answer for the amount of new development they want is nothing, never. Um, and finally, location of government. Wasn't there a wonderful Yes Prime Minister episode on, on this? I'm sure, I'm sure that, that there was. Um, I think the answer is politically that's even less feasible than everything else that, that we're talking about, although Tony can, can uh, but certainly this felt in Paris, right, where in fact I can imagine abundant new development in central London far more than I can in, in Houseman's Paris. And in Paris, the, if anything, the government's footprint is even larger. So I think just the economic, not saying that it's any more likely to happen in Paris than in London, but the economic case for thinking about moving at least some functions of government, you know, maybe moving the Palais de Justice out of the you know, 15 top real estate spots in the entire city, you know, I, I think the economic case for that seems, even, seems particularly strong. And we'll come back to your city as a future of all people we're going to ask you that um, at the end. Awesome. Okay. Okay. I, I better choose. refer to the first one since I'm part of that. I, can we have a nuanced discussion in public? I think uh, uh, my own suggestion is that all other newspapers from the Financial Times should be made illegal. <laughs> 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 And everybody should be required to read the FT, in which case they would certainly have discussion of all these issues, at least at, at a modestly nuanced level. <laughs> Failing that, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I have a feeling about moving the capital. Uh, I think it would be less significant for London than you think. Uh, London has, of course, always been both a political and cultural and commercial, uh, not both, it's been a political, cultural and commercial capital. And if you actually, unlike Paris, by the way, uh, I think the commercial and cultural is immensely important and it doesn't really depend on the government. So you could move the government, it, it would change it a bit, but New York does fine. Mm. In fact, New Yorkers wouldn't feel that adding Washington to them would be a large contribution to their welfare. Uh, uh, um, of course, I have been thinking about where it should go, and it obviously should go to the country's capital before London. Uh, which is, of course, Winchester. Winchester yeah. um, uh, and that would be, it's a nice city, and we could ruin it very nicely. Um, <laughs> I'm now going to say something which, thank God, my wife is not here to hear, which is I basically don't, have never really seen the point of local government. Um, so I have very controversial views on lots of things. I'm not really wildly in favor of farming, as you've already heard, except as you regard it as a hobby, which means that I'd like farming to be pretty and large-scale modern farming is hideous. 
uh, but the um, local government is very, very problematic when it's involved in doing things like this, like planning land use. Um, what I want to do, I'm perfectly happy to, 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 to deliver the rubbish services. So uh, we've taken away education pretty well for local authorities, very good idea. I don't see why we shouldn't take away all planning decisions from all local authorities and give them to the Secretary of State. Or even better, to a nice bunch of intelligent technocrats. Yes, I know it's not going to happen, but that's what I would do. Phoning that, the mayor will do. Um, is the market working? Up to a point, Lord Copper, which of course means no. Uh, the, 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 uh, um, the problem is that the supply of the most important, no, not the most, yeah, the most important factor of production in, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, real estate um, is completely and utterly regulated. This is not a, what I would call a market. Now, it's a market given that, so the market clears, and we see the clearing behavior of the market in that context, but despite the fact that, as I said, the price of uh, residential land is 150 times the price of neighboring agricultural land, you can't just go and do what the market would normally do, which is just start developing all that agricultural land. You, you, that is prevented. So it's, the market exists, but it's so constrained that, it's, that it obviously operates in a, very, uh, in a very distorted way. I was thinking about the crossrail thing, and, and I, I know this is not really what you meant, but when I was thinking of having real road systems which allow us to put tower blocks all the way around London, in the Green Belt, I suppose, or sort of a bit beyond the Green Belt, we'd be tower blocks all the way around. That strikes me as like Parisian Bombier, and that didn't work too well. It's an interesting model, however, and of course the French did the exact, this is fascinating, there's a last one I want to make. The French did an inverted Cheshire. Paris did an inverted Cheshire. We decided that internal uh, uh, London doesn't really matter very much. We can anybody can live there, largely because it's so big, as you said. But the green belt must be preserved, so everybody outside can live as if they are uh, a manorial barons. That's the idea of the green belt. <laughs> the French, of course wanted to make sure that humble people and immigrants, God knows, these dreadful immigrants couldn't live in Paris, so they, so they, they, they their equivalent of the Greenback ended up as the Bondier. I can't entirely work out what that tells you about the, the dominant orientation of the two civilizations beyond the possibility that the French really, really like living in Grand Paris and the English really, really like pretending they're Jukes. <laughs> <laughs> Michael. Well, maybe I'll, I'll kick off City of the Future. Oh, well, unless you have any of these you'd like to select well, I, I a think, thought uh, to add, and then we'll do the city, the city of the, it was one I, city. I think, I think we, we actually, when you really think through any of these yep. issues, what we've resigned ourselves to in terms of what we expect of government, I mean, the answer to the affordable housing question, you know, the revenue side gets solved, right? And then the question is, how do you produce, right? You can't look to the industry alone to produce. You must have planners that make decisions that actually facilitate uh, grand visions that can achieve the, the end objective. And, and actually, I think we're, we're so often you start down that path, it's just that we don't even think it's possible, right? Starting with infrastructure, creation of infrastructure, right? When you see what Crossrail, and that is, that's something we can all actually, hey, yeah, maybe we could actually do something along Crossrail, produce some real meaningful answers to a portion of this. It's not going to solve the million people coming to London, but it's meaningful, right? We should be doing more of that, and we shouldn't give up on the notion that more of that can be done. And planning, establishing plans that actually answer the question, uh, likewise, is, is possible, but we haven't really, we, we, we're not requiring that of our, of our uh, planners, our, of our public authorities, and they must make those decisions, ultimately, right? I think the idea, why is planning or education, why that ever became a political, uh, a political beast? Why would p elected officials have anything to say about educating our children or actually accommodating the future of the, the, the people who are not yet here? Of course, a politician is not going to care about the person who's not here because they don't vote. How do you make decisions that are right for the people that are not, not yet at the table? It's got to be done by professionals, right? Or technocrats, people who know what they're doing. That also is not something out of the realm of possible. 
So anyway. That's okay. We did do it with monetary policy. Mm -hmm. It is true. Yeah, we did yeah, do it. Yeah, yeah. We never thought we could. It, it, it's, it's not as difficult once you recognize the answer. And, and, and that becomes clear very quickly. We are but a step away from handing all government to technocrats. So let's stop, let's park there, especially at this moment. No, not in all government, just, all right, just land use planning. Well, yeah. I think it's quite well, and, and monetary policy and some other things. Let's, um, the city of the future. It was a city. Have I got one city? You wanted one yeah. name? Yeah. All right. You, Michael, you obviously had one, so go well, for I, it. In thinking it through, I, I thought about different cities by geography, and then I quickly came to the reasons why it couldn't be the city of the future, right? So, I mean, I think there are major cities which will continue to grow and be mega cities, but I'm not sure they will be successful cities. So I, I, my vote is with Singapore, in part because it shows the benefits of a benev benevolent dictatorship, right? <laughs> it actually, while you can't, you can find fault in it, it is astounding what that place achieved. 50 years ago, upon founding, 85% of the people there were squatters. And within 25 years, they were not, right? That was not achieved through democracy. It was, it had, it was achieved with some tough um, edges. But it's a very successful city, very diverse, lots of immigrants, lots of energy. I think it's, a, it's actually a city with great potential to continue to become better. So I would, I would say Singapore. It, unquestionably, in my view, the best run city in the, in, in the world. But you were shaking your head. No, no, I was, I was oh, just right. I was agreeing, oh, I was agreeing with agreeing. it, although I, right. I, I, I wouldn't give it the, I guess I'm, I'm leaning against giving it the city of the future right. because it's... It's present. Yeah, or in some sense it is. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to make up for my previous attacks on Mumbai, and I'm going to go with Mumbai. Okay. I mean, a place that is, if currently run, a disaster, uh, but, you know, we're being optimistic here, and certainly the, you know, the promise of... India is so grand. I mean, the human capital is so exciting. The energy is so fulfilling that I like to, I want to, in my part, in a completely optimistic, you know, blue skies view that it's going to be Mumbai that's going to rise up and, and lead us into the 21st century. Martin, you want to nominate a city for the future? I think it would be ridiculous for me to do so since uh, I find it difficult enough to understand the cities of the present. <laughs> uh, I, the only way I can respond to it is the way I think about it is, where would I like to spend eternity if I were going to live that long? A great answer. Great and the answer. answer to that, of course, is London. Yeah. 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 Well, that's, uh, that was a good end to the evening, so thanks for the question, <laughs> in every sense. Now, I'm going to say no more than two or three words just to, uh, to, to uh, not to summarise, but I have a book on a bookshelf at home called London, the Heartless City, written in 1977 when the city's population was plunging and when there were, for a brief period, more housing units than households. And there was still a chronic housing problem. Real shortage, lots of people, misallocated housing. And I just begs the question to, for me of whether these big dynamic, endlessly changing, even when they're declining cities, can ever effectively allocate certainly in big open free countries, allocate housing in a way that comes anywhere near fully meeting all the expectations of the people who live in them. I just park that thought. Second thing, I think we bumped up against taxing housing to build housing. The slightly odd way which, in, which we in Britain, and particularly in London, because it's possible, have ended up is in a sense for the government effectively taxing the very high property values that it's created by the means we discussed earlier. In this weird way, the public can't understand. Such an odd way of doing it. Uh, so in the end, you get huge extra, you get bigger buildings, higher densities, all sorts of things, which would be explicable if they were explained, but actually come about through some complicated planning process, which none of the public understand. And I do think there's uh, quite a lot of deconstruction uh, needed there. On the question of the removal of the capital, I have a vague memory. Harold Wilson uh, thought of moving the capital, and it was mu mused at the time, moving it perhaps to Yorkshire, vague sense. But I think these days, just think of the challenge of deciding where to, t to move it. It's rather like getting rid of the monarchy. You know, there are countries that have tried to get rid of the monarchy, but when they try to replace it, that's where the problem comes. I've got a comes. brilliant answer. Go on. I haven't thought about Go on. this one. You move it to Edinburgh. 
it. <laughs> <laughs> There we are. <laughs> Two problems solved at once. <laughs> Two problems solved at once. It seems to me that the Wolf Planning Commission <laughs> may be the way forward for many things. Ladies and gentlemen, thank our panel, Michael, Ed and Martin. <laughs>